The Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Ott. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from World Tales by Idris Shah. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Dick Whittington and His Cat The thrilling and romantic story of poor Dick Whittington and his rise to fame and fortune through the exploits of a cat, which was his only possession, was first published 350 years ago in London. It has remained a rags-to-riches epic ever since. Sir Richard Whittington did in fact exist. He was indeed three times Lord Mayor of London. He did marry a certain Alice Fitzwarren. These, however, are the only three true facts of the story, so far as can be ascertained. He was not of humble birth. The son of Sir William Whittington of Gloucestershire, he was born in about 1358, almost two centuries before his highly coloured adventures first saw the light of day. And yet his biographer, Bessant, seems to have believed the tale of the cat. Research has shown that the tale was current in Europe in the century before Whittington's birth. It is to be found attributed to a merchant of Genoa and two citizens of Venice, not to mention its fame in Portugal, Norway, Denmark, Russia and France. The earliest form is the legend of the foundation of the royal house of Case, written by Abdallah, son of Fazlullah of Shiraz in Persia. 60 years before Dick Whittington's birth. He, in his turn, refers to the events of the 11th century. This enthralling grafting of a popular story onto a real-life figure's history is supplied by the famous folklorist Andrew Lang in this version, from the ancient chapbook version of Gom and Wheatley. Dick Whittington was a very little boy when his father and mother died, so little indeed that he never knew them, nor the place where he was born. He wandered about the country as ragged as a colt, till he met with a wagoner who was going to London, and who let him walk all the way by the side of his wagon without paying anything. This pleased little Whittington very much, as he wanted to see London badly, for he had heard that the streets were paved with gold, and he was willing to get a bushel of it. But how great was his disappointment, poor boy, when he saw the streets covered with dirt instead of gold, and found himself in a strange place, without a friend, without food, and without money. Though the wagoner was so charitable as to let him walk up by the side of the wagon for nothing, he took good care not to know him when they came to town, and the poor boy was, in a little time, so cold and hungry that he wished himself in a good kitchen and by a warm fire in the country. In this distress he asked charity of several people, and one of them bid him, Go and work, you idle rogue. That I will, said Whittington, with all my heart. I will work for you if you will let me. The man, who thought that this was wit and impertinence, though the poor lad intended only to show his readiness to work, gave him a blow with a stick which cut his head so that the blood ran down. In this situation, and fainting for want of food, he laid himself down at the door of one Mr. Fitzwarren, a merchant, where the cook saw him. Being an ill-natured hussy, she said that if he did not go about his business, she would throw boiling water on him. At this time, Mr. Fitzwarren came home and also began to scold the poor boy, telling him to go to work. Whittington answered that he would be glad to work if anybody would employ him, and that he should be able if he could get some food to eat, for he had had nothing for three days, and he was a poor country boy and knew nobody and nobody would employ him. He then tried to get up, 
but he was so very weak that he fell down again. The merchant was sorry for him, and he ordered the servants to take him in and give him some meat and drink, and to let him help the cook to do any dirty work that she had to give him. People are too apt to accuse those who beg of being idle, but give themselves no concern to put them in the way of getting something to do, or considering whether they are able to do it, which is not charity. But we return to Whittington, who would have lived happily in this worthy family had he not been bumped about by the cross cook, who was always roasting or basting, and who, when she had nothing else to do, used to smack poor Whittington. At last Miss Alice, his master's daughter, was told about it, and she took pity on the poor boy, and made the servants treat him kindly. Besides the crossness of the cook, Whittington had another difficulty to get over before he could be happy. He had, by order of his master, a bed placed for him in an attic, where there were a number of rats and mice. They often ran over the poor boy's nose and disturbed him in his sleep. After some time, however, a gentleman who came to his master's house gave Whittington a penny for brushing his shoes. This he put into his pocket, being determined to use it to the best advantage, and the next day, seeing a woman in the street with a cat under her arm, he ran up to know the price of it. As the cat was a good mouser, the woman asked a great deal of money for it. But on Whittington's telling her that he had but a penny in the world, and that he wanted a cat badly, she let him have it. This cat Whittington concealed in his room, for fear she should be beat about by his mortal enemy the cook, and here she soon killed or frightened away the rats and mice, so that the poor boy could now sleep as sound as a top. Soon after this the merchant, who had a ship ready to sail, called for his servants, as his custom was, so that each of them might venture something to try their luck and whatever they sent was to pay neither freight nor custom, for he thought justly that God Almighty would bless him the more for his readiness to let the poor partake of his fortune. All the servants appeared except poor Whittington, who, having neither money nor goods, could not think of sending anything to try his luck. But his good friend Miss Alice, thinking his poverty kept him away, ordered him to be called. She then offered to lay down something for him, but the merchant told his daughter that would not do, it must be something of his own. Upon which poor Whittington said he had nothing but a cat which he had bought for a penny that was given him. Fetch the cat, boy, said the merchant, and send her. Whittington brought poor Puss and delivered her to the captain with tears in his eyes, for he said he should now be disturbed by the rats and mice as much as ever. All the company laughed at the adventure, except Miss Alice, who pitied the poor boy, and gave him something to buy another cat. While Puss was beating the billows at sea, poor Whittington was severely beaten at home by his mistress, the cook, who used him so cruelly, and made such fun of him for sending his cat to sea, that at last the poor boy decided to run away, and having packed up the few things he had, he set out very early in the morning on All Hallows Day. He travelled as far as Holloway, and there sat down on a stone to consider what course he should take. But while he was thinking, bow bells, of which there were only six, began to ring, and he thought their sounds addressed him in this manner. Turn again, Whittington. Thrice Lord Mayor of London. Lord Mayor of London, said he to himself. What would one not endure to be Lord Mayor of London and ride in such a fine coach? Well, I'll go back again and bear all the pummeling and ill usage of Sicily rather than miss the opportunity of being Lord Mayor. So home he went and happily got into the house and back to his work before Mrs. Cicely made her appearance. 
we must now follow Miss Puss to the coast of Africa. How perilous our voyages at sea, how uncertain the winds and the waves, and how many accidents attend a naval life. The ship which had the cat on board was long beaten at sea, and at last, by contrary winds, driven on a part of the coast of Barbary, which was inhabited by Moors unknown to the English. These people received our countrymen with civility, and therefore the captain, in order to trade with them, showed them samples of the goods he had on board, and sent some of them to the king of the country, who was so well pleased that he sent for the captain and Mr. Fitzwarren's agent to his palace, which was about a mile from the sea. Here they were placed, according to the custom of the country, on rich carpets, flowered with gold and silver. The king and queen being seated at the upper end of the room, dinner was brought in, which consisted of many dishes. But no sooner were the dishes put down, but an amazing number of rats and mice came from all directions and gobbled up all the meat in an instant. The agent, in surprise, turned round to the nobles and asked if these vermin were not offensive. Oh, yes, said they, very offensive, and the king would not give half his treasure to be freed of them, for they not only destroy his dinner, as you see, but they attack him in his room, and even in bed, so that he is obliged to be watched while he is sleeping for fear of them. The agent jumped for joy. He remembered poor Whittington and his cat, and told the king that he had a creature on board ship that would get rid of all these vermin immediately. The king's heart heaved so high at the joy which this news gave him that his turban dropped off his head. Bring this creature to me, said he. Vermin are dreadful in a court, and if she will perform what you say, I will load your ship with gold and jewels in exchange for her. The agent, who knew his business, took this opportunity to set forth the merits of Miss Puss. He told His Majesty that it would be inconvenient to part with her, as when she was gone the rats and mice might destroy the goods in the ship, but to oblige His Majesty he would fetch her. Run, run, said the Queen, I am impatient to see the dear creature. Away flew the agent while another dinner was provided, and returned with the cat just as the rats and mice were devouring that also. He immediately put down Miss Puss, who killed a great number of them. The king rejoiced greatly to see his old enemies destroyed by so small a creature, and the queen was highly pleased, and desired the cat might be brought near, that she might look at her. Upon which the factor called, Pussy, Pussy, Pussy! and she came to him. He then presented her to the queen, who started back, and was afraid to touch a creature who had made such a havoc among the rats and mice. However, when the man stroked the cat and called, Pussy, Pussy, the queen also touched her and cried, Putty, Putty, for she had not learnt English. He then put the cat down on the queen's lap, where she, purring, played with Her Majesty's hand, and then sang herself to sleep. The king, having seen the exploits of Miss Puss, and being informed that her kittens would stock the whole country, bargained with the captain and factor for the whole ship's cargo, and then gave them ten times as much for the cat as all the rest amounted to. On which, taking leave of Their Majesties and other great personages at court, they sailed with a fair wind for England, whither we must now attend them. The morn had scarcely dawned when Mr. Fitzwarren arose to count over the cash and settle the business for that day. He had just entered the counting house and seated himself at the desk when somebody came tap, tap at the door. Who's there? said Mr. Fitzwarren. A friend, answered the other. What friend can come at this unseasonable time? A real friend is never unseasonable, answered the other. I come to bring you good news of your ship Unicorn. 
the merchant bustled up in such a hurry that he forgot his gout, instantly opened the door, and who should be seen waiting but the captain and agent, with a cabinet of jewels and a bill of lading, for which the merchant lifted up his eyes and thanked heaven for sending him such a prosperous voyage. Then they told him the adventures of the cat, and showed him the cabinet of jewels which they had brought for Mr. Whittington. Upon which he cried out with great earnestness, but not in the most poetical manner, Go, send him in, and tell him of his fame, and call him Mr. Whittington by name. Mr. Fitzwarren was a good man, for when some who were present told him that this treasure was too much for such a poor boy as Whittington, he said, God forbid that I should deprive him of a penny. It is his own, and he shall have it to a farthing. He then ordered Mr. Whittington in, who was at this time cleaning the kitchen, and would have excused himself from going into the counting-house, saying the room was swept and his shoes were dirty and full of hobnails. The merchant, however, made him come in, and ordered a chair to be set for him. Upon which, thinking that they intended to make fun of him, as had been too often the case in the kitchen, he begged his master not to mock a poor simple fellow who intended no harm, but let him go about his business. The merchant, taking him by the hand, said, Indeed, Mr. Whittington, I sent for you to congratulate you on your great success. Your cat has made you more money than I am worth in the world, and may you long enjoy it and be happy. At length, being shown the treasure, and convinced by then that all of it belonged to him, he fell upon his knees and thanked the Almighty for his providential care of such a poor and miserable creature. He then laid all the treasure at his master's feet, who refused to take any part of it, but told him he hoped the wealth would be a comfort to him and would make him happy. He then applied to his mistress and to his good friend Miss Alice, who refused to take any part of the money, but told him she heartily rejoiced at his good success and wished him all imaginable happiness. He then gave presents to the captain, the agent, and the ship's crew for the care they had taken of his cargo. He likewise distributed presents to all the servants of the house, not forgetting even his old enemy the cook, though she little deserved it. After this, Mr. Fitzwarren advised Mr. Whittington to send for the necessary people and dress himself like a gentleman, and made him the offer of his house to live in till he could provide himself with one better. Now it came to pass, when Mr. Whittington's face was washed, his hair curled, and he was dressed in a rich suit of clothes, that he turned out to be a genteel young fellow, and as wealth contributes much to give a man confidence, he in a little time dropped that sheepish behaviour which was mainly caused by a depression of spirits, and soon grew a sprightly and good companion, and Miss Alice, who had formerly pitied him, now fell in love with him. When her father saw that they had this liking for each other, he suggested that they should marry. The Lord Mayor, Court of Aldermen, Sheriffs, the Company of Stationers, the Royal Academy of Arts, and a number of eminent merchants attended the ceremony, and were elegantly treated at an entertainment made for that purpose. History further relates that they lived very happily, had several children, and died at a good old age. Mr. Whittington served Sheriff of London and was three times Lord Mayor. In the last year of his mayoralty, he entertained King Henry V and his Queen after his conquest of France, upon which occasion the King, in consideration of Whittington's merit, said, Never had a prince such a subject, which being told to Whittington at the table, he replied, Never had a subject such a king. His Majesty, out of respect to his good character, conferred the honour of knighthood on him soon after. Sir Richard, many years before his death, constantly fed a great number of poor citizens, built a church and a college to it, with a yearly allowance for poor scholars, 
and near it erected a hospital. He also built Newgate Prison and gave liberally to St Bartholomew's Hospital and other public charities. Don't count your chickens. This tale is the origin of perhaps the best-known proverb in the world, the girl and the pitcher of milk. Professor Max Muller remarks how the tale has survived the rise and fall of empires and the change of languages and the perishing of works of art and stresses the attraction whereby this simple children's tale should have lived on and maintained its place of honour and its undisputed sway in every schoolroom of the East and every nursery of the West. In the Eastern versions, it is always a man who is the fantasist and whose hopes come to grief. In the West, it is almost always a woman. The man generally imagines that he will marry and have a son, while the woman tends to think of riches and marriage. The outline is invariably the same. Details change. In the Hindu tale, in the Hutubadesa, flour is spilt. In La Fontaine's French fable, it is milk. Trujana, of the medieval Spanish Don Lucano, given here, finds the honey coming to grief. In the Arabic of the Kalila, it is butter and honey. The Turkish Forty Viziers collection and the Greek of Simeon feature oil and honey. In Aesop, it is eggs which are smashed. In the Arabian Nights, glass. Emphases of the meaning vary. With the Brahmin, it is greed and lack of foresight. With the Persian devotee and the Turkish, undue concentration on one thing. In the Arabian Kalila and elsewhere, there is a hint that violent action is one's undoing. Rabelais, in his Gargantua, attributes this folly to a shoemaker who struck a pot of milk in his excitement at becoming rich in fantasy, destroying that which may lead to success by the thought of that success itself. Once upon a time, there lived a woman called Trujana. Not being very rich, she had to go yearly to the market to sell honey, the precious product of her hive. Along the road she went, carrying the jar of honey upon her head, calculating as she walked the money she would get for the honey. First, she thought, I will sell it and buy eggs. The eggs I shall set under my fat brown hens, and in time there will be plenty of little chicks. These, in turn, will become chickens, and from the sale of these, lambs could be bought. Trujana then began to imagine how she could become richer than her neighbours and look forward to marrying well her sons and daughters. Trudging along in the hot sun, she could see her fine sons and daughters-in-law and how the people would say that it was remarkable how rich she had become, who was once so poverty-stricken. Under the influence of these pleasurable thoughts, she began to laugh heartily and preen herself, when, suddenly striking the jar with her hand, it fell from her head and smashed upon the ground. The honey became a sticky mess upon the ground. Seeing this, she was as cast down as she had been excited, on seeing all her dreams lost for illusion. The Hawk and the Nightingale The origin of fables has been claimed for the Jews, Solomon is reputed to have composed two or three thousand of them, the Greeks, the Indians and the Egyptians. Aesop is said to have lived in the 6th century BC, but there are indications of fables in Egyptian papyri of 800 to 1,000 years earlier. Jotham's apologue of the trees who desired a king was for long thought to be the oldest, but the Hebrew book of Judges in which it is found dates in its present form only from about the 3rd century BC. The hawk and the nightingale, given here, is from the works of the Greek poet Hesiod, who flourished about 800 BC. 
It has been regarded by many as the earliest complete fable traceable to a literary work. It has been attributed to Aesop and others, but Hesiod is the earliest source. It certainly seems like the prototype of a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. A nightingale was sitting alone among the shady branches of an oak tree. She sang with so melodious and trilling a voice that the woods echoed with her song. A hawk, perched not far away, was searching the woods for something to catch. No sooner had he found the tiny songster than he swooped, caught her in his talons, and told her to prepare for death. Oh, said she, do not do anything so barbarous and so unbecoming as to kill me. Remember, I never did anything wrong, and I would only be a mouthful for such a one as you. Why do you not attack some larger bird, which would be a, a braver thing to do, and would give you a better meal, and let me go? Yes, said the hawk, you may try to persuade me if you can, but I had not found any prey today until I saw you, and now you want me to let you go in hope of something better? But if I did, who would be the fool? This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.